Hello and welcome oh. to the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilley on the fifth anniversary of his passing. Our topic of today, Persian Robotics, Semiotics Applied to the Emergence of Symbols. Today with us, we have two special guests, Professor Kato Takafumi and also Dr. Sachi Arafat. Welcome, Professor Kato. Welcome, Dr. Sachi. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. As usual, we will have the lecture from uh, our guest, our main guest, uh, Professor Kato, first. And then um, we will continue with the comments from Dr. Sachi. Um, background of our main guest, uh, Professor Kato. Um, Professor Kato Tagafumi is a full time Hi. lecturer at Sasaki University in Japan. He received his in 2018 from the Kyoto University. He is the author of the Persian of the Theory of an Extended Mind. It's published in Cognitio, Revista di Filosofia, volume 16, number 1, 2015. He has translated a range of important works into Japanese, such as The Pragmatic Maxim, 2011, Perspectives on Pragmatism, again, 2011, and also The American Pragmatist, 2013. His research primarily interests uh, the work of Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, his semiotics and also um, Persian semiotics applications. Nowadays, as we know, Persian semiotics has received um, enthusiastic attention from uh, a wide range of scholars and scientists across the board. And uh, uh, one of such attention is also from cultural anthropologist and frontier robotics researcher. So his present research projects overview such interdisciplinary discussions such as, such as a philosopher and supplements them with an appropriate philosophical context aiming to increase philosophers' commitment and also to reveal contemporary significance to the pragmatist uh, thoughts. Uh, on this note, I'd like to invite Professor Kato to open the forum and uh, share his views on the topic. Uh, I'm very glad to participate in this uh, conference. So thank you very much, all of them. Muito obrigado, tudo. Uh, today, I'm I'm talking about uh, I'm talk about uh, Persian robotics semiotics applied to the emergence of symbols. Uh, before I start the talking, uh, please notice all of you that. Uh, please ask your questions in the chat box on the webinar system because uh, maybe the time is very limited. And uh, of course, you can contact me via email as well after the lecture. Uh, here is my email address. And uh, uh, today's table of content is here. Well, <laughs> let's get started. Uh, introduction. Uh, today, artificial intelligence, AI, and robots are rapidly entering our society. AI is being implemented in diverse situations such as image recognition, speech recognition, and artificial voice. Robots are also being used for security out of factories and are even being cuddled as pets. The governance of AI and robot development and management is rapidly 
becoming a matter of debate. As for robots, such as self-driving cars, are subject to strict safety and security screening. And the same applies to medical robots. With this background in mind, we would like to ask the question, how can robots communicate with humans? This question is raised not only by robotics, but also by cognitive science and the philosophical field of semiotics. The realization of robots that can communicate with humans is not only expected to uh, have practical benefits in the field of engineering, but will also provide insights into understanding of human cognition and will involve in the research of semiotics in order to understand what kind of semiotic phenomena occur between robots and humans. Furthermore, the contribution of philosophical fields such as semiotics is also expected to serve as a platform for receiving those interdisciplinary interests. The key question here is what exactly is meaning for robots and humans? Or in other words, how is this meaning generated? For us humans, meaning is very important. It is intrinsically related to our survival. If we, as biological creatures, do not identify and appropriately act on what nourishes us and what harms us, we will soon die. Then, what about AI and robots? How do AI and robots acquire or understand the meaning of symbols in their environment? How should we view our natural language? Uh, what exactly are the barriers to social robots using language? These questions are crucial for the coexistence of AI, robots, and humans in the future society. Japanese robotics researcher Taniguchi Tadahiro has proposed the theory of symbolic, symbol emerging systems since around 2010 and has elucidated system dynamics in which robots equipped, equipped with AI and actual bodies find meaning uh, through interactions with the environment and other agents. Robots with such functions have been realized to a certain extent. Symbol emergence in robotics promoted by Taniguchi can be said to be at the intersection of AI and robotics. The notion of symbols is crucial not only for semiotics, but also for AI. Until now, AI research has proceeded based on the implicit assumption that the symbol systems operating in society are fixed. However, the person semiotics rather see these symbols dynamic phenomena. Uh, as Charles Sanders' passage semiotics suggests, we would like to contend that the function of symbols is closely related to habit. As will be discussed in more detail later, symbols do not constitute a fixed dyadic relationship between objects and symbols, but exist in a triadic relationship. Uh, that includes the interpretants. In the field of cognitive robotics, the idea of symbol emerging systems has been proposed to recognize the dynamic nature of this triadic relationship. This lecture will discuss how Taniguchi's theory of robotics and the theory of symbol emerging systems are supported by the ideas of Charles Sanders' Pass's semiotics, and how Pass's insights can be utilized in their theory in the future. Uh, section one, symbols in robotics. The term symbol has caused confusion in the field of AI and robotics. In traditional AI research, particularly in the 20th century, symbols have been regarded as tokens for mental operations. The physical symbol system hypothesis typically represents the traditional concept of symbols in AI. Newell et al. described the concept of symbols as follows. A physical symbol system consists of a set of entities called symbols, 
which are physical patterns that can occur as components of another type of entity called an expression of a symbolic structure. Thus, a symbolic structure is composed of, of many instances or tokens of symbols related in some physical way, such as one token is next to another. At any instant of time, the system contains a collection of these symbol structures. In line with this concept, traditional AI research has been conducted along with what is known as symbolic AI. In symbolic AI, it is assumed that the symbol system is designed by external designers, namely researchers and developers. The arbitrariness or autonomy of the symbols was not taken into account. Symbolic AI-based approaches have had much trouble in producing robots that can behave appropriately in real environments. In contrast, Brooks argues that animals do not have such logical symbol systems and focuses on embodiment. The Sun-Sumption architecture, which in his view does not require a symbolic system, allows robots to act adaptively in their physical environment. Brooks' approach seems to suggest a way forward for robotics with the idea of designing the process by which a robot with a body is able to behave appropriately in its environment. In the symbol emergence in robotics, the concept of symbols have been considered in line with these ideas. Many researchers are unaware of the difference between symbols in symbolic AI, i.e. symbols in symbolic logic, and symbols in human society, i.e. symbols as in Persian semantics. Traditional AI research is originally based on computer science, and the computer science is primarily based on mathematical and uh, symbolic logic. The symbols of symbolic AI were, therefore, not symbols for human communication, but for computer and the mathematical logic. Today, however, even AI and robotics researchers need to consider symbols for humans because they need to consider symbolic interactions, including verbal communication between AI systems and humans. Over the past few decades, computer science has become a vast discipline that includes many types of human activities. As a result, interactions between human and the computer and between humans and robots, which necessarily have considered symbols, have become more and more important area of research. Section two, Persian semiotics. When considered along these lines of interest, it is Persian semiotics that attracts attention. A short remark may be necessary here. There are at least two names for the study of science, semiology and uh, semiotics. Although they are often used almost indistinguishably, the former refers to those derived from the science theory of Ferdinand Saussure, while the latter refers to that developed with Persian semiotics. Social semiology explains the workings of science by means of a dyadic relation between sin signifiant and signifié. A particularly important aspect of this theory is that it pointed out that the correspondence between signifiant and signifié is arbitrary. That is, for example, the signifiant for cat could be gato, cat, or sharp. And there is no inevitability in this. On the other hand, Persis semiotics analyzes the function of sign and the triadic relation consisting of the sign, the object that the sign represents, and a third term called the interpretant. It is important to note that the addition of the interpretant enables us to explain not only the arbitrariness but also the plasticity of the sign's meaning.
、uh, interpretants are easier to understand if we take them for a start as human interpreters who connect symbols to objects and understand them. Let us assume, for example, that a Japanese speaker who knows no French is an interpretant. If this person comes across the word neko, a neko is a Japanese word for cat,、uh, she will interpret it by thinking of cats she has encountered in the past, connecting the word to the general concept of neko in her mind, and so on. But for now, This person cannot connect the word chat, a French word for chat, to the same concept. Or perhaps、uh, it is possible that she may connect the word to the concept of chat, an English word for a casual conversation、uh, based on her knowledge of English. However, if this person learns French, she may be able to link the word chat to the concept of chat. And moreover, may be able to determine whether that word appears as English or French and choose her interpretation. In this way, an interpretant allows us to consider, for instance, why the arbitrary connection between s c i e n c e and object is established in the way it is. It thus provides some explanation for the fact that there is plasticity in the meaning of the sign. First of all, This is an advantage of Persian semiotics. Furthermore, first r e g a r d these triad creations of signs as process and calls them semios.、Uh, this suggests an important idea that is central to Persian semiotics and his pragmatist thought. This is because behind the term semiosis is the idea that. The triadic relation of signs is not a fixed relation, but involves a process of growth in which the semantic function is established through the intermediation of an interpretant between sign and object. Precisely because we see the working of sign as a process, we can focus on how the interpretant is formed, how the relationship between sign and object changes. As the interpretant changes, or to put it more generally, how the triadic sign process is established and changes or evolves. Earlier, for the sake of explanation, the interpretant was set up as a human being. However, in fact, anything that mediates between sign and object can be seen as interpretant. As is well known, Uh, Past argues that there are three types of signs icons, index, and symbols. And this classification is determined by the nature of the interpretant set between each sign and object. In the case of icons, the sign and object are linked by sharing sensory similarities. In the case of indexes, by a physical connection. And in the case of symbols, by being conventional. Conventionally prescribed as such. Thus, whether it is a sensory similarity, a physical law, a social or a cultural convention, it can be an interpretant. In addition, one can consider an interpretant to be a collection of different kinds of intermediation. A typical example of such a correct interpretant would be found in a human mind. Indeed, First, consider the human mind to be a kind of huge collective semiosis. In other words, the human mind is considered to be a collection of sign processes in which various interpretants, such as habits and social conventions, mediate between various signs and objects. How then? Is the collective semiosis of the human mind established? Interestingly, in his article, Questions Concerning Certain Faculties Claimed for Man, Peirce describes the process by which the infant establishes the ego. The ego, as it were, arises when the child acquires language and realizes his own ignorance. Peirce takes the following example to illustrate the point. 
a young child overhears the adults around him saying that the stove is hot. But the child thinks that the stove is not hot. This is because the child's body is not touching the stove and does not perceive the heat from the stove. But as soon as the child touches the stove, he will realize that the adults around him were right. In other words, he will realize that his own thoughts were wrong and that he was ignorant. At this moment, the child supposes a self in which this ignorance can inhere. In this way, the child establishes self-consciousness through the knowledge of his own imperfection and begins to listen to the statements of the adults. Plus, generalizes these arguments and contends that the concept of self is inferentially derived from one's own ignorance and uh, mistakes. Let's impose this discussion on the idea of the human mind as a semiosis discussed above. We can then envision the formation and development of a semiosis of the human mind. In other words, when a child realizes his ignorance and starts to listen to what the adults around him say, he can be seen as adapting the external semiosis of adults as part of his own semiosis. Moreover, to a lesser or greater extent, this is what adults experience in their daily lives. Adults may also incorporate external semiotic processes as part of themselves. For example, uh, when they become aware of their own mistakes. In this way, person semiotics allows us to conceive of a huge semiosis called the self, which as it experiences various phenomena in the outside world, adapts external semiosis as part of itself, establishes adaptive habits and grows up. Persian semiotics thus shows the way how signs, especially symbols, are connected to their objects and establish meaning through a huge symbolic process, namely a human as semiosis, which has undergone a process of habit establishment. Let's put Persian ideas we have seen so far in the context of AI research and robotics. According to Peirce, the human mind can be regarded as a huge symbol process. In other words, it is a huge bundle of habits, which is a result of a process of establishing adaptive habits by incorporating the semiosis of the external environment. It is clear that such a conception of symbols is completely different from the concept of symbol assumed by traditional symbolic AI. The introduction of an interpretant allows the plasticity of the relationship between symbol and object to be taken into account. Furthermore, by viewing symbolic function in terms of processes, it becomes possible to depict the process by which an agent in the breeding symbols acquires adaptive habits through interaction with the environment. In this respect, the conception of symbols offered by Persian semiotics is appropriate for the AI research and robotics we promote. As is well known, Pass was one of the founders of pragmatism. The prefix pragma in the word pragmatism originally means action in ancient Greek. As this suggests, Pragmatism can be characterized very broadly as a um, thought that explains the meaning of things in terms of action. In this view, for example, the meaning of the symbol beer glass can be explained in terms of uh, you can drink beer tastily with it or uh, you can hold a banquet with it and get along with someone. Properties such as hardness are also explained, for example, as even if you rub various things against something hard, uh, it would not get scratched. In each case, the explanation is derived from the perspective of 
how it is connected to the action. It should be noted here that the explanation of meaning in the pragmatist method does not attempt to give a definition that can be descriptive in a dictionary-like form. Whether it be a glass or a hardness, they make sense in the light of the accumulation of acts of human society. Accumulation of the various practices we have developed over the years. For such pragmatism, the meaning of symbols is plastic and even can change according to our future activities. The affinity between Persian thought and the robotics we are aiming for can be recognized uh, in this openness of the meaning of symbols. Uh, section 3, Symbol Emergence Systems. Uh, let us now return to the question posed at the beginning of this lecture. How can robots communicate with humans? What exactly is meaning for robots and humans? At the very least, the picture assumed by symbolic AI, in which a fixed system of symbols defined by humans is given to a robot, and the robot understands the meaning of the input information accordingly, will not be able to satisfactorily answer these questions. Rather, by adapting the ideas of Persian semiotics, these questions can be answered. Through interaction with the surrounding environment, the various agents, human established the symbol function as semiosis, namely a huge collection of habits, and hence their concepts that understand the as a statement and communicate with others. Uh, is it possible to realize the same process of establishing a huge seamless process in a lower? If this could be achieved, it could be said that the lower could understand the meaning of various symbols in the external environment and communicate with humans. To reconstruct in robots the process of cognition and language acquisition that humans experience, and thereby to deepen our understanding of the working of the human mind and intelligence, is the constructive approach behind Taniguchi's symbol emergence in robotics. The system of symbols in which humans already participate in their everyday communication is a type of symbolic system called a symbol emergence system. In Taniguchi's theory, it is envisaged that robots and AI will increasingly join this system in the future. Let's take a closer look at this theory of symbol emergence systems. Before talking about symbol emergence systems, we need to understand the concept of emergence systems. Generally speaking, a system consists of several components. A social system is made up of human beings, while a living organic system is made up of cells. It is important to note that a system is not a material entity, but a conceptual thing that captures the way in which they operate together. Even when we consider the same objects as a system, what we consider as its components can vary depending on the theory. Uh, although it may seem natural to consider each individual human as a component of a social system, uh, there are other ways of looking at it. For example, Luhmann developed a theory of social systems based on autopoiesis theory by defining the component of a social system as communication. The concept of a system in itself represents a model for perceiving and understanding certain phenomena. In many vital systems in nature, the components operate autonomously and at the same time depend on their interaction. For example, living organisms 
are made up of the activities and interactions of cells. And the company organization of humans are made up of individual people making decisions and interaction uh, with each other. The interactions are essentially local, but each local interaction does not occur completely independently. Through their interactions with each other, each element adapts to the system and comes to constrain each other mechanically, biochemically, or informatically. Such a biological system gains the property of a micro-macro loop. The micro-macro loop is a bidirectional process in which the global order emerges in a bottom-up manner through local interactions between the components of the system and the global order thus created becomes a boundary condition that governs the local interactions between the elements in a top-down manner. When we speak of emerging systems, emergence means that these micro-macro loops bring about the acquisition of new functions, traits, behavior, etc. in the system. And an emergence system is a system in which such emergent phenomena continue to be inherent. Let me illustrate this more concretely with the example of a company organization. A company is characterized by various factors such as financial management, employment systems, and corporate culture. For a new employee in a large company, these global characteristics of the system of a company would be the already established order. However, company organizations are living organisms and there was no such already uh, established order when the company was still in its infancy. After a company is founded by an entrepreneur and a few uh, founding members, uh, its internal systems and corporate culture are gradually developed to deal with uh, external and internal issues. Thus, the global order in the company is created in a bottom-up manner. Even after a company has become a large enterprise, its internal systems and corporate culture are gradually written in response to technological innovations, changes in the economic situation, and other factors. The global order may appear to be an absolute, unchanging constraint on the components of the system, but in fact, it is created in a bottom-up manner by local interactions, changes, and adaptations in the environment. In this sense, a company organization is an emergence system. In order to determine whether a system is a type of emergence system, uh, it is important to identify its components, capture the dynamics of the individual components, and understand uh, what kind of micro macro loops exist among them. Now, we humans communicate by using a variety of symbols, including language. Uh, the system of symbols used by humans can be described as a kind of emergence system. The process by which humans understand the meaning of symbols and become proficient in their manipulation is a process of bottom-up change and adaptation through physical, sensory motor, and the cognitive interaction with the environment, including interaction with the people around them. However, it is not enough for an individual to form a symbol system within themselves in order to be able to communicate with others. In order to fulfill communication with others, they must at least share a vocabulary for various concepts with others. Common vocabulary, such as apple or a chat, is a basic element of a symbol system in a community. But, of course, a symbolic system does not consist only of a vocabulary set. In order to communicate by using symbols, the formation of shared beliefs is necessary. What we call shared beliefs here are implicitly shared understandings for interpreting symbols. For example, the utterance brings a cup along 
does not specify which cup in front of you is referred to, nor how you should bring it. The interpreter of the utterance has to infer the intention of the utterance based on shared beliefs, considering previous experience, context, situation, and the speaker's state of mind, and then move on to the action expected. The important thing about shared beliefs is that they are only valid within the community that holds them. This shared belief, together with vocabulary, grammatical knowledge, etc., may be regarded as composing one symbolic system. Symbolic systems are formed to realize communication within the group based on the conceptual systems of uh, conceptual systems formed within each agent. The formation of the global order of the symbolic system enables each agent to use it to realize cooperation with others uh, through symbolic communication. However, this symbolic system also constrains our behavior. We are often able to appropriately interpret um, inadequate utterance along the speaker's intention. And this means that we are at the same time constrained to be diverted from possibilities to interpret it otherwise. Having a common symbolic system also means that we are, in a sense, forced to share a common perception. Although in a process of concept formation close to each individual, it might be sufficient to proceed with articulation and categorization suited to each individual. In order to overcome the discrepancies in communication with others in the outside world, such a process of recognition also needs to be coordinated to the others. The others here are not individuals. It is, so to speak, the entire community that holds the symbolic system. Here, the top-down constraints of the symbolic system are functioning. There is a bi-directional bottom-up and top-down process in the system of communication through symbols. Individual agents form concepts and communicate locally through their interaction with the environment. In order to realize such local communication, a symbolic system is formed bottom up, and uh, this symbolic system constrains local communication. A micro macro loop exists here. A symbol emergence system is a system that internalizes these micro macro loops and generates symbolic communication. The symbol emergence system is an emergence system in which we are inevitably embedded in order to realize the capacity for symbolic and linguistic communication of humans. We humans can be said to have formed a symbol emergence system in order to realize uh, symbolic communication. Or we can say that symbolic communication is an emergent function in the symbol emergence system. Uh, section 4, Symbol Emergence in Robotics. Along this line of thought, Taniguchi has proposed a descriptive model of symbol emergence systems that takes into account cognitive and uh, social dynamics. Uh, figure 1 depicts an overview of a symbol emergence system consisting of multiple agents, such as people and future robots. Note that a symbol emergence system is not a symbolic system itself, but a March agent system consisting of agents capable of symbolic communication. Uh, in a symbol emergence system, each agent forms its own internal representation through physical interaction with the environment. Human children can carry out this learning process without linguistic stimuli. This process is called representation learning in recent AI research, 
By generating symbols in relation to the formed internal representation, each agent can express its intentions and the cognitive states in external symbols. However, due to the arbitrary nature of symbols, another agent who catches a symbol as another agent who catches a symbol cannot infer its meaning without sharing an interpretation. If agents share an interpretation of a symbol, uh, they become able to use the symbol in a cooperative manner. In this way, agents gradually share knowledge of symbols in a bottom-up manner in order to adapt to their environment and act effectively as a group. In this way, a symbol emergence system is organized. Once this is achieved, agents within the symbol emergence system can use the symbolic system as long as they follow the methods for using the system. These can be seen as top-down constraints imposed by a higher level system on the communication of lower level agents. Thus, functions emerge in the system based on a micro-macro loop in which lower level interactions organize the higher level order and the emergent order imposes constraints on the lower level interactions. This is a general description of a symbol emergence system. One method for studying such symbol emergence system is the symbol emergence in robotics. Symbol emergence in robotics adapts a constructive approach to symbol emergence systems using AI and robotics technologies. In the constructive approach, researchers aim to build models that reproduce object phenomena. Since the meaning of a symbol depends on the sensory motor information obtained by the agent, it is crucial to reproduce the overall dynamics of the symbol emergence system, including both symbolic communication and physical interaction. More specifically, internal representations formed on the basis of physical and social interactions are essential for semantics. Uh, for semiosis. This is because a constructive approach to the symbol emergence system requires a robot, namely an embodied artificial cognitive system. Symbol emergence in robotics has so far developed com has so far developed computational models that can reproduce certain part of symbol emergence systems. In particular, a computational model representing a compute, computational process of internal representation formation has been studied in relation to concept and category formation and lexical acquisition. Uh, for example, multimodal classification has been thoroughly studied from the perspective of symbol emergence in robotics. Agents in a symbol emergence system need to obtain representation learning cap capabilities. Nakamura et al. proposed a multimodal latent degree allocation and showed that a robot can find many object categories by integrating multimodal information such as visual, auditory, and tactile information. It was also shown that the robot can find object categories in an unsupervised manner even without human annotated data. This shows that although classification is arbitrary in semiotics, the distribution of multimodal sensory data provides sufficient clues to classify certain types of objects. It also allows the robot to automatically find the relationship between object categories and words by providing linguistic cues together with the multimodal information. Uh, because the detail of this robotics research are uh, beyond the scope of the speaker's expertise, uh, more discussions are to be found on your own, please. Uh, in the following, as a philosophical researcher, I would like to point out some issues to which Persian ideas may be able to contribute. Uh, section 5, uh, Persian philosophy of mind. Symbol emergence systems suggest a new form of community 
that includes humans and robots. Furthermore, there will perhaps be a future in which a variety of agents, unimaginable at the present time, will join this community. In such a new community, humans will also have to change. What will be the self-perception of human agents in future simul emergent systems? Uh, this is a question uh, that must be addressed during the development of the theory of simul emergent systems, and I would like to suggest that some insights into this question can be found in Percy's theory, Persian thought. Percy's way of understanding the human mind involves ideas similar to those of the extended mind, as discussed in the contemporary field of philosophy of mind. The extended mind is a way of understanding the mind that is illustrated by the following example. Otto has a memory impairment and can only retain memories for a short period of time. So he carries a notebook with him at all times. When he needs to recall something, instead of referring to the memory in his head, he looks in this notebook and behaves based on it. For example, if he wants to go to the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA in New York, Otto opens his notebook, finds a description, MoMA is on the 53rd Street, uh, believes that description, and goes to MoMA. A person without memory impairment would refer to the memory in her own head, obtain the belief that MoMA is on the 53rd Street and go to MoMA. In the latter case, the process of obtaining the belief and deciding the action is completed in the head. In Otto's case, by contrast, he decides to act after referring to his notebook. So the process of acquiring this belief and deciding to act includes the notebook. In other words, in this case, the individual's mental processes are established with a hybrid system consisting of the brain and the notebook. The extended mind is a theory that mental processes can be told, can be thought of as extending to things outside the head, such as this notebook. The example of Otto and his notebook is used here in accordance with the paper that first presented the theory of extended mind. But even without such an example, if uh, one thinks about the way smartphones are used in everyday life, the idea that mental processes are established, including those outside our head, will be accepted as a natural one. However, a tricky problem arises when the theory of extended mind intersects with the concept of the self. Even if mental processes may extend outside the head or body, can we really say that the scope of what we can call self is also extended? Can we say that Otto's self extends to the notebook? Uh, this lecture will not tackle this question directly, but it is worth pointing out that this question can be avoided if we take into account passing ideas. As we saw in the previous section, in Percy's view, the self is one huge semiosis, uh, which continues to grow as it incorporates the semiosis of the external world. If we were to superimpose this on the example of Otto, we can say that Otto without a notebook is one semiosis, and Otto with a notebook is also a semiosis called Otto, which has been updated uh, by incorporating the semiosis of the notebook. Note here that the scope of Otto's self is updated rather than extended. It may sound strange to state that Otto extended, but it makes more sense to summarize the case as 
Okto began to supplement his memory with a notebook and to recognize himself with the notebook as his own self. Thus, in the light of the theory of mind, the picture of the human, uh, the picture of the mind that the theory of extended mind has tried to present can be put forward in an unproblematic way as an updated semiosis. Pursuit's theory of mind suggests a more flexible view of the self or mind. For example, uh, we can choose to use or not use our smartphones depending on the situation. When using a smartphone, you can regard your own self as cognitive system in which the in, uh, in which the mental processes in our mind and the process of using the smartphone are combined. In contrast, when you keep the smartphone away from you uh, because you want, for instance, to reflect in a quiet environment, you will regard your cognitive system, uh, which doesn't include the symbol of the smartphone, as your own self. In this way, you can choose the semiosis you regard as your own self in different ways depending on the situations. Furthermore, since Percy's theory of mind suggests that things outside the body can also be included in the semiosis of self, you can conceive of your own self on various scales or levels. We live in different communities depending on the situation and the semiosis at work in each of these communities can also be incorporated into the semiosis of the self, depending on the situation, just like the semiosis of a notebook or a smartphone. You can choose, for example, uh, your own self as a member of a family, a member of an organization, or a member of a society, etc., depending on the situation. This property of Percy's theory of mind, uh, which allows us to conceive of a mental process that incorporates the semiosis of different communities, is of particular interest to contemporary anthropologists. Drawing on Percy's theory of mind, Canadian anthropologist Eduardo Cohn discusses the particular self concept of the lunar people in the forested areas of eastern Ecuador. The lunar people believe that the self is spread throughout the forest environment uh, that envelop their bodies. In this case, the self also encompasses the semiosis of the whole ecology surrounding the lunar people. In light of these ideas of past, a human being who finds herself in a community that includes robots will come to regard herself living together with the robots as her own self. This means that both humans and robots will be responsible for the emergence of symbolic system. In other words, the process of interacting with the environment and establishing adaptive habits will develop together with robots. The functions that emerge in this way will be completely different from those implemented by the symbolic AI theory, uh, which was uh, unilaterally given to the robot by humans. Uh, perhaps, it will perhaps it will present a way of cognition, language system, and intelligence that are unimaginable to humans today. The task of envisioning the concrete form of such a new symbol systems is left to future research. However, it should at least be pointed out that by following Percy's theory of mind, the emergence of new practices, functions, intelligence, etc. in a symbol emergence system that includes robots as engines can be envisioned more flexibly and vividly. Uh, section 6, uh, symbol emergence systems as future communities of inquiry. Another personal insight that could contribute to the theory of symbol emergence systems is the idea of regulative assumption. 
In explaining the gist of pragmatism, Pass took the concept of reality as an example and argued that the concept of reality implies that uh, implies that which must be assumed in order to advance scientific inquiry. Uh, did you feel that uh, this was a bit of a leap? Uh, however, uh, in, scientific, in scientific inquiry, uh, it is assumed that there are strict natural laws at work uh, which are not influenced by individual thoughts. And then hypothesis formation and experiments are carried out in order to clarify these laws. Uh, it is precisely on the basis of the assumption of reality as a strict fact of the external world, uh, independent of the workings of the human mind, that the practice of scientific inquiry is founded. Uh, with this in mind, it is not so far-fetched to bring the concept of reality to scientific inquiry. In his article, How to Make Our Ideas Clear, uh, published in 1877, Pass formulated his famous pragmatic maxim. However, he was not satisfied with this form formulation and continued to try to reformulate pragmatist thoughts more rigorously over the next 30 years. It was during this period that William James gave a series of lectures that brought pragmatism to the public attention. James's Pragmatism, published in 1907, is a compilation of these lectures. In it, James states that the pragmatic maxim ought to be expressed more broadly than Mr. Pass has expressed it. He contends that the ultimate test for us of, of what truth means is indeed the conduct it dictates or inspires. I should prefer to express Pass's principle uh, by saying that the effective meaning of any philosophic proposition can always be brought down to some particular consequence in our future practical experience. Uh, the problem is that James is trying to attribute the meaning of truth and the philosophical propositions to consequences that occur in our future. If we take James' statement as it stands, it seems as if truth could depend on our subjectivity. However, first, However, Persian pragmatic maxim was put forward with the aim to clarify several concepts used in scientific inquiry and properly advance the inquiry. If James's pragmatism involved the idea that the truth pursued by scientific inquiry may be subject to human subjectivity, such a thought is unacceptable to pass. In these contrasts, the future of uh, passes pragmatism that seem most noteworthy in relation to the theory of symbol emergence systems become clear. Passes pragmatism involves the idea of a community of inquirers who aim for a truth that is not dependent on human subjectivity. According to the pragmatism defined by Pass in his later years, truth means a belief that would never be biased even when the inquiry is pursued as far as it can effectively advance and enough evidence and arguments are presented. Of course, it is scientific inquiry that Pass has in mind. In the inquiry, a community of scientists repeatedly form hypotheses and conduct experiments, assuming that there is a strict real existence that is not subject to human thought. These assumptions that must be posed in the course of inquiry, such as the concept of reality, are called regulative assumptions. A reading contemporary scholar of Persian thoughts, uh, Sheryl Misak, argues that not only scientific inquiry but also inquiry in ethics and uh, politics 
can be seen as setting up relative assumptions in each field and aiming for truth in the sense that Pass describes. Uh, what insights does the passing idea bring to the theory of simple emerging systems if we realize the various kinds of communities of inquiry as collective semiosis, each of which evolves with its own regulative assumptions of inquiry? This is a question I would like to ask at the end of this lecture. Let us consider a community of inquiry consisting of humans and robots. Symbol emergence system have to involve a micro macro loop consisting of both a bottom up process of establishing the symbolic system and the top down process of constraining each agent. In the community of inquiry, regulative assumptions act as top down constraints. On the other hand, these regulative assumptions are established through the accumulation of local practices of inquiry. In this way, each of various communities of inquiry can be considered to act as a simple emergency system in its own right. In the same way, uh, in the same way that humans have acquired language, each community generates its own system of appropriate practices of inquiry. Future robots will join these communities of inquiry and experience a co-creative learning process with humans. They will learn the regulative assumptions that drive the inquiry of the community, and then, in interaction with the environment, they will learn how to communicate with the humans who are also members of the community. However, this learning process is not a one-way process. Humans may also renew their ways of communicating with robots in their simple imaging system and modify their regulative assumptions. In this way, the semiosis of the entire community of inquiry is renewed and the symbol emergence uh, proceeds under the interaction between humans, robots, and the environment. At present, the community is inevitably conceived from a human-centered perspective, but the future may be near when semiosis of robots play a rather impactful part in our symbol emergence system as in the case of Otto with his notebook. Although questions such as whether or not artificial intelligence will have the mind have a science fiction-like feeling, uh, the insights of Pass's philosophy will make it easier to envision the relationship between humans and robots in a simple emerging system as a community of inquiry. How will the symbiosis of human beings change in the symbol emerging system that develops together with robots. Uh, the theory of symbol emerging system should also consider this point with what we are interested from Perth. Conclusion. The aim of this lecture was to link the discussion of symbol emergence in robotics and Persian semiotics to merge the two different disciplines and to advance the discussion. To this end, the lecture explained the theory of symbol emerging systems in relation to Persian semiotics. First, the history of symbols in AI and robotics was briefly explained, and the symbols were reinterpreted from the perspective of Persian semiotics, symbols as semiosis. Uh, second, theory of symbol emerging systems developed on the basis of Persian semiotics was reviewed and research on symbol emergence in robotics was briefly outlined. Third, the insights of Persian thought that could make a further contribution to the research of Taniguchi were examined. As discussed in this lecture, Symbol emergence in robotics has the potential to bridge AI and semiotics. In general, discussions on the 
logical relationship between models in semiotics and models in AI and robotics tend to be theoretical disputes due to different interpretations of even the same very basic terms and concepts, such as symbols. However, by modeling semiotic phenomena in terms of computational and robotic models, we come to develop more concrete discussions. AI research has made tremendous progress in the last decade. However, uh, it has not had a sufficient impact on the concept and discussion of symbols in semiotics. The symbol emergence in robotics clearly provides an interface between semiotics and the embodied artificial cognitive systems. Uh, in order to understand the dynamics of semiotics, further interdisciplinary discussions are expected at the intersection of AI, robotics, and semiotics namely, symbol emergence in robotics. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kato. Um, it's interesting uh, the way that you have approached the topic in terms of uh, symbolic communication as an emergent function and um, its um, key uh, distinction with um, AI practices as it's uh, happening today in terms of meaning uh, fixed, uh, um, which is different from the Persian uh, symbolics, which is um, allowing some growth and evolution or evolution of uh, the symbol. Uh, so um, you have also quoted some interesting uh, studies that has already have already been achieved, like the Nakamura 2009, which gives you an incentive to believe that such kind of hypothesis and uh, uh, is uh, such kind of hypothesis is something that should be considered, and uh, it could impact our way of uh, consideration in terms of uh, how such kind of extended mind and interaction with the future robotics would impact the human semiosis itself. Uh, we have today our intervener, uh, Dr. Sachi. Uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Sachi to uh, share his comments on, on this kind of uh, hypothesis. Um, a, brief, um, a brief introduction on profile for Dr. Sachi. Please allow me a few words. Uh, Dr. Sachi Arafat is an assistant professor um, for data sciences in the King, um, uh, in the, um, in the South Arabia University. It's a very famous university. And uh, his research actually uh, lays at the intersection uh, of data science and philosophy of science and technology. It's interesting to mention also some of uh, previous work for Dr. Sachi in the uh, Glasgow, uh, in the University of Glasgow, uh, UK, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering Research as a research fellow at the School of Computing Science. Um, his um, research consisted of some kind of uh, uh, inspired model from the quantum theory in terms of application for socio um techno uh, technological behavior it's it sounds very complicated admitting it but uh, even more uh, interesting uh, to highlight here is his uh, monograph search uh, foundation uh, published in 2019 by mit uh, press uh, co-authored with uh, e ashuri and um, it's basically um, nominated as uh, best book uh, for the information science in 2020 by the Association of Information Science and Technology. So what the monograph is about is um, a new kind of science inspired by classic um, um, philosophical tradition and by the work inspired also by the work of Heidegger. And what is the monograph suggesting is that the data science should be rebased on rigorous philosophical foundation in order to create an explicitly explanatory science of AI. 
uh, from the ground up for understanding and technology mediated experience. So perhaps uh, Dr. Sachi can tell us more about this in his uh, intervening comments also for uh, Professor Kato. Uh, Dr. Sachi, you're welcome. Uh, hi, uh, hi everybody. Thank you for that introduction. Um, can you hear me all? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I, I, I will uh, maybe very slightly mention what, what you just said about the, my previous work, but uh, it'll be mainly focused on how that is related to uh, Dr. Kato's uh, work here. Uh, so first, thank you, Dr. Kato, for that interesting presentation and paper, and for the IO2S folks for giving me this opportunity to comment on this very interesting paper and this interesting work in general. First, I think it's important to mention that there are two general points of convergence between this paper and my research interests. One is philosophy of technology and philosophy in general, meaning in Dili's term, the sinoscopic or sinoscopic sciences. And the other is idioscopic or empirical technological science, often termed computer science uh, in this particular case, but known by a multitude of other names and distinctions within uh, these uh, technological science area from AI to machine learning to information science, information retrieval, even cognitive science and so on. So there are many aspects about Dr. Kato's paper that are therefore interesting to me to comment on. I chose mainly, however, to comment on a high level picture underlying this paper, that of the interplay between the stenoscopic and the idioscopic, right, uh, within the paper. I think it is important to follow through on all the implications, all the implications this distinction determines in this area of sim symbol emergence. So if we can sort of divide the things Dr. Kato talked about into the sinoscopic and idioscopic, I think that I find that to be very interesting uh, as a way forward uh, to, to deal with some of the challenges that Dr. Kato talks about at the end of his work. Uh, uh, just another note uh, before I get into this, my reading of Dili and scholastic philosophy, as well as Heidegger that I use in my own work, uh, actually inform the comments that I'm about to give you below um, on the sinoscopic aspect, so that first aspect. I'm no purse expert, and so most of what I uh, understood about uh, purse and uh, what uh, Dr. Kato applies from purse is filtered through Dili and uh, Dili's work and also Brian Kempel's work, who's uh, with us on this call. Um, as for the comments below, uh, the comments below relating to the idioscopic aspect, meaning to the computer science aspect, therefore my own background in AI and data science, as well as their historical cognate, cybernetics. So Dr. Kato presents a series of interesting research questions that I want to frame based on uh, this background of mine and, and my own attempts to do similar things. So my own attempts to develop what I call a sinoscopic foundation for the te technological sciences that recognizes semiosis as central. Um, and this sort of divides into two parts. So my comments will be in these two parts, mainly in the first part, but a little bit on the second part. So the first part, is about, so the comments I'm going to follow up on uh, is firstly on the application of the cinescopic or philosophical to provide the principles that can be used by the idioscopic sciences. In, in this respect, technological science, by which I mean, you know, computer science, information science, all the different names that come under that. Right? So, um, so the application of the cinescopic to provide the principles that can be used by idioscopic sciences uh, which are technological sciences and arts in general. So the, the technological science in this respect is something that studies technology, however you define it. And the technological arts is something uh, you know, that uh, deliberates upon how you create that technology, the kind of programming that you do, the kind of systems you make, all that stuff. So it's the application of, the, uh, of philosophy to these things to produce systems to study and produce systems. Systems like what? Machines, algorithms, particular organizations of society as well, which are like top-down systems, right? So you can actually you know, get people to walk in this direction and that direction by having a factory in the middle of a city so that everybody walks to the factory in the morning, right? That organization on the city, which you can place in the city by, organ by, by setting up particular uh, institutions and other things within the city, that is also a kind of top-down technological organization. Okay, so 
when you apply philosophy to technology as such to create such systems, um, what you're concerned with is not only uh, some of the principles that uh, Dr. Kata already mentioned, such as the principles of symbol and sign, communication and agent, but many others as well. Given that the artifacts such as robots and algorithms are artifact enriched networks, so networks that contain artifacts in the middle, so that include artifacts and people, meaning non-artifacts. So, so principles that cover all these things, um, that all these things that a symbol emergent system would engender, right? So all these things, when you have a symbol emergent system, it would have all these things, right? So if there are also all these sort of things in a symbol emergent system, the cinescopic syn study of this system must consider a wide array of human phenomena to be effective in helping humans complete tasks. Okay, so that, 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 that's the first aspect of Dr. Kata's work that I see as important uh, for me specifically. Uh, and the second aspect uh, that I'm going to comment on is the effect on society of effective artifactual symbol emergence systems, which is what Dr. Kata talks about towards the end of his presentation. In the terminology of my work, Search, found, search Foundations, that the book uh, um, Alma mentioned earlier, um, the way I kind of uh, put this as a question is, what are the repercussions of technology-mediated experience? Where technology here is defined as the collection or network of generally programmable devices, such as iPhones. So we're not talking about, you know, like sofas and tables and chairs, because they're not generally programmable. Right? They, they can't be made into something that they're not. Right? After their sofa, you can't somehow change the sofa into something else without making it other than a sofa. Right? Whereas if I have an iPhone, I have you know, hundreds of different apps, all do different things. It's still an iPhone, but I can do so many different things with it that it, you know, it, it almost like changes its nature in some sense. Right? Okay. So that's what I mean by technology here, right? collection of technology. Um, so we want to talk about, so the second part of my comments will be about this aspect, like when you have technology mediated experience with technology defined in this way, what's the effect of that, right? So um, with respect to the first part of these comments, so the cinescopic part, right? The, the application of philosophy to all of this stuff. I want to firstly agree in the strongest sense with the implication of Dr. Kato's paper that the technological sciences do need to become self-aware of the relevant philosophical positions they end up taking in their discourse. The, this awareness is sorely missing in the academic community, right? Uh, so yes, in computer scientists who are very technical, but even those computer scientists and others who like to think of what they call foundations, right? Even there, it is sorely missing. Uh, the overall gist of the following comments then in this section are that we must, by a sort of explicit direct process of self-awareness, ask self-awareness as academics, as you know, computer scientists, as technical folks, or people interested in foundations of technology, what the foundations, meaning the philosophical, stenoscopic foundations of tech sciences are, and we must explicitly choose a philosophical paradigm to help us discover these foundations, something that recognizes semiotics and semiosis as central. We must not do this in the usual way of just borrowing a concept or two here and there from philosophical discourses, as that is like tinkering with one part of a big picture, right? And this is very common in, in you know, computer science academia. To write, it, to create a new computer science trend, you just have to go to a different field, you know, philosophical or sociological or whatever, uh, pick a theory and then try to apply it in some rough way, write a paper and write lots of papers, and that's it, right? Um, and as to what that theory really means and if it is right or not in really discovering the underlying principles, that's a very secondary concern, okay? So with this, um, uh, let's look at some specific points, okay? So number one, Dr. Kato asks an important question at the beginning of his paper, how can robots communicate with humans? Right. Hidden in this question is something I think is a little bit more preliminary what does it mean for robots to communicate with humans? What does that actually mean? A question I think the, the rest of uh, Dr. Kato's paper talks about indirectly in, in or directly. 
a key point in the paper is that communication means semiosis, or it must have something to do with semiosis, and it means the existence of triadic relations, ontological existence of triadic relations. That is, what it means for both humans or robots to understand something, understand in quotes, that is to understand the meaning of something, or at least to look like they understand something, means triadic relations must exist, means that there has to be semiosis and so on. An observation I'd like to make here is about the idea of understanding here. So even though, the, the, you know, what it means for a human to understand is one thing, beyond the, you know, biological concomitants of that, so beyond, you know, our senses being involved, our looking left, looking right, using our body, all of this, yes, all of, all of that is involved in understanding. There is a rich, rich interaction. Uh, yeah, there's a rich interaction. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find. This. Ah, yes. So beyond these biological uh, concomitants, which have been studied in depth by Dili across his many works, um, there is something, you know, uh, that is, in terms of, and Dili phrases this or. Uh, talks about this in terms of classical psychology, right? There's something beyond the biological, right? Beyond the things you can e easily observe, like the hands moving and the eyes moving and all of that, right? That, that is used to talk about what it means for human beings to understand, right? So understanding involves, according to this particular and ancient idea of man, a rich interaction between various human faculties or powers as similar to, but yet differentiated from other animals. So while we might use the word understand for a robot or an algorithm, that cannot mean the same thing. In the same way, a simulation that represents accidental characteristics of a phenomenon is not equivalent nor a proper copy of the thing itself. Yet, even though the robot or algorithm is ontologically of a different nature than the human, lacking a natural form in the, lingu in the language of ancient philosophy, it can nevertheless be an interpretant. And there is an interesting discussion to be had here as to what kind of interpretant this is, where and how it fits into Peirce and Dili's understanding of reality, etc. More specifically, though, um, what's involved here in, in the machine, in the artificial or the artifact, um, instead of formal causes characterizing the case in the human uh, system, you know, within its faculties, we have in the machine case the operative or me mechanical causes. So ontologically, there's different things involved. And this is further explored uh, in various works like classical and modern, but this is particularly good. I don't know if you can see it. This is uh, Nature and the Artificial by Engelmann. I think I said that correctly. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so even though the artifact does not understand in quotes as the human does, it nevertheless participates in a triadic relationship. This is the common ground. And in that sense, the machine can be understood by humans to be suggesting meanings without understanding them by following an algorithm or process. As Leibniz already theorized uh, in his understanding of this combinatorial, combinatorial machine that was the precursor to the computer of modern computer science. Thus, the symbolic emergence systems mentioned in the paper should be understood, I think, explicitly as meaning suggesting or generating combinatorial systems that simulate accidental aspects of real entities. Right? Uh, I wanted to clarify this because I thought the word understand, when you apply it to two things that are quite different, can confuse us later on. Right? So I agree with Dr. Cato that the cinescopic study of such systems must adopt a notion of symbol. Um, that uh, therefore captures this triadicity of the sign going beyond the meaning of mathematical symbols. Absolutely. However, I do think the notion of symbol as mathematical and other non-commonly humanly understood symbols, like you know, all the things that happen at the computer level, I think this must also be accommodated in a cinescopy of the text sciences. But I'll come back to this a bit later. So to summarize, I think it is important to keep clear that humans and robots are not doing the same thing ontologically speaking in every sense when there is a communication between them, right? When they're talking to each other, different things are happening, right? Um, and that exploring this difference is important for understanding what human-robot communication means. 
So even though something similar is happening because there's triad, you know, there's semiosis, there's interpretance and so on, it is important to explore that difference here, right? Okay. A second observation here is also uh, at the cinescopic level. Dr. Kato's paper suggests that symbolic emergent systems can be useful for understanding humans in general by their providing a constructive dynamic model of human beings as individuals and also social organisms. This is basically saying that SE models, meaning social uh, uh, symbolic emergent models, can provide a good method for what I call ideoscopic investigation in technological sciences. I would agree with this, but would also add that the effectiveness of this to give us true understandings as well as useful devices and applications is dependent on the success, or the, sorry, dependent on the soundness of the cinescopic reasoning underlying it. That is a good understanding of what an artifact and a simulation is relative to what it is trying to resemble is necessary for that simulation to be effective, right? Uh, for giving us an understanding of what's going on. There are many instances of problematic inferences within the technological sciences, identifying humans, for example, as only a kind of computer, right? That can send us, I think, in the wrong direction. And this is very common, right? Because, you know, computer scientists don't go into the cinescopic much. They don't, they don't go into the philosophical. So when they borrow things from the philosophical and other places, they kind of get it all tangled up, right? A third observation that follows the second one above is that if SE systems, symbolic emergent systems, are to be used to simulate not only an individual but society in general, then to understand its validity, validity we need to bring in a wider cinescopic science. Right? Meaning what? Something that understands the individual as not cut off, but indeed part of and constitutive of the world. Exactly what uh, uh, Dr. Kato was talking about. I want to make one distinction here, though. The cybernetic nature of emergent symbol systems that uh, Dr. Kato uh, discusses in sections three and four in the paper and also the presentation, such as the, the, the part about the, the micro macro loop. Uh, the micro macro loop model as amongst other things uh, a model for how symbols become stabilized i would place that in the idioscopic camp it's an idioscopic model meaning there is something more fundamental on which it is based which i think it needs to come out right uh, what must underlie that um, what must underlie that is the cinescopic foundation um, uh, is what dr kato brings in later the extended mind idea Part, which partly forms that foundation. Now, this idea I find to be very interesting, and I do uh, also uh, discuss it in my work. Um, now, this idea, I think it, it actually links back to something quite ancient that somewhat dissolves the idea, an ancient idea that dissolves this idea of inside versus outside with respect to the human mind. That to know something is to somehow absorb it. And this is what the idea is, that when you know something, you absorb it or you become part of it. There's a unification happening. It is not difficult to see why this makes sense. If knowing entails a semiosis, and given that we're always in the process of knowing as that's what it means to inhabit an environment, and as humans, we are never not in a world, right? In a umwelt or a lebenswelt and so on. Um, this means that we're being materially separated entities. So me being separate from this device and you, this separateness is a fact that severely underdetermines what we are, right? It doesn't really capture what we are. Our separateness, physical separateness, does not really capture what we are. That the semiosis that takes place, that work to regulate our being in the world, with all those entities separate from us, they bring to us that, you know, these um, semiosis that bring to us things in the world, in some sense, um, they work to make those other things part of us as well, right? Part in codes. That requires a lot of fleshing out as to how other things can be part of us. Um, so I'm not going to go into that here. This does indeed reflect an idea coming to major world traditions that in some sense, the cosmos is a reflection of man. And man in some sense contains the cosmos. Somehow, the proliferation of technological devices in our modern time that allow us in, the car in this time to see ourselves as extending beyond our physical bodies presents us an opportunity to understand afresh this ancient idea. Right? I think to fully realize what it means to use symbolic emergent systems 
as idioscopic models to understand human beings and societies, which is what Dr. Kato and the symbolic emergence researchers want to realize, a grounding in prior synoscopy is necessary. This is a grounding in, in, in that which understands the relation between man and environment. And of course, we have indeed development of the scholastic tradition, precisely that, through his centralization of the relation, the means by which semiosis takes place and man, through his many constitutive faculties, inhabits the world. Linking back to the notion of habits that Dr. Kato talks about in his paper. Dr. Kato's question of how will the semiosis, and this is towards the end of his paper, how will the semiosis of human beings change in the symbol emergence system that develops together with robots? is very interesting, as it could not have been imagined by the ancient philosophers whose work ground both that of Dili and Peirce. Given in particular, and this, I think, is key to understand the way in which modern devices mediate our experience of reality, including the reality that is ourselves, right? Meaning they're ubiquitous. They're always mediating. Like, as time progresses, there's more and more devices. You're going to have, like, Google Glass kind of things, and people are going to always live through these devices. And less of their lives is going to be living through things that are not those devices. So mediation is now increasingly ubiquitous. Okay. This question relates to what Dr. Kato calls, uh, um, Dr. Kato calls regulative assumptions. Background facts, the way I understand it is background facts conditioning the communities of inquiry, um, symbolic emergent systems will create or engender something expanded upon by Heidegger, in fact. This also links stenoscopically, not only as to the idea of the ability of a sign to show or reveal something, which of course is, runs throughout the work of Peirce and Dili and Heidegger, but also as Dr. Kato indicates to the ethical, right? Meaning that our stenoscopic base for our ideoscopic technological sciences must cater for the ethical in addition to what has been mentioned above. So those are my comments on the first part, which is you know, the philosophical foundation, the cinescopic aspect. And then I have just one comment on the, the, the idioscopic, right? In terms of how computer science fits in, right? As the idioscopic science and all the related uh, cognate sciences, uh, cognate to computer science. Now, following on from those above cinescopic observations, I want to make a further observation. But here with respect to the idioscopic science that Dr. Kato's work suggests, which is required not only for more concrete analysis of the relation between semiotics and AI, but to also create a certain type of technology mediated world. Because it's not about you do the analysis, but then based on the analysis, you make the tech and then the tech changes the world, right? Okay. And it comes back to a point I made above in relation to, uh, Dr. Uh, in relation to the point Dr. Cato makes about technology, uh, technological sciences or technological science folks understanding the notion of symbol as mathematical symbol only, right? I think any successful idioscopic technological science for which Dr. Kato's idea of symbolic emergence from the constructive methodology, meaning that it allows us to create models and physical systems and look at that and then reflect back on what's happening with us, right? I think any successful such uh, constructive methodology will always involve mathematical modeling and programming to realize. In doing such modeling, the researcher is involved in complex types of abstraction. Not only abstraction of simple natural things, but of relations. By abstraction here, I mean it in a very general sense, meaning the, just a modern uh, general sense, but also technical sense in the Aristotelian and, and classical philosophical form as well. So it is crucial um, for the cinescopic ground for such an ideoscopic science to be very, ex to very explicitly deal with the nature of mathematical and logical symbols and mathematical modeling apparatus in general, so that the various types of abstractions that technological science people make can be untangled as to what they really mean, right? Um, the technological sciences are full of such tangles in their discourses. So for example, um, in, 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 the, in what I teach in my day job, information retrieval, the science of search engines and so on, um, a document as to what it is for a search engine is discussed according to a wide range of what I would call idioscopic theories. It can be a mathematical vector, a probabilistic function, it can be a, a, a 
represented as a, as a logical claim. It can be any other sort of mathematical entity. It can be a bag of words. It can be understood simply as a very basic, um, you know, biological construct, which is a response to a stimulus, right? And so on and so on. These various theoretical objects, some of which are explicitly mathematical, are often used interchangeably to mean the same thing. And this is a cause of great confusion. It is important that our sinoscopic science clarifies these various senses by being informed by the sinoscopy of mathematics, the philosophy of math, right? Amongst other things, as well as semiotics. And in general, a wide philosophical paradigm that includes an understanding of man and society and the cosmos, as we've mentioned above. Those are just some of the things that I think are important to realize here because to, to realize this symbolic emergence project, like all the concepts we have to fix, a lot of them are actually sinoscopic. And that sinoscopic is not just about technical objects, you know, it ex expands to all of philosophy, to be, to be honest, right? Um, so it, it's about having that underlying philosophical paradigm to go forward in developing this ideoscopic science that I think that, that I got as the main, um, you know, uh, inspiration from this paper of Dr. Katov. And this completely aligns with on my work and, you know, how I think about things as well. This, um, these are just some of the things I found interesting in Dr. Katov's paper. I find his work important for suggesting how to investigate the grounding for the text sciences, as well as for reimagining the text sciences according to such a coherent principled ground. This is crucial since more and more of our lives are is mediated by tech. And we need to be clear about what that mediation means and what it is doing to us. Right, so thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to comment. And thank you, Dr. Kato, for your paper. Thank you, Dr. Sachi. Thank you for your comments. So Dr. Sachi argues for a need of sinoscopic base for the current and the future development of uh, idioscopic sciences. I think this is in tune with uh, Professor Kato. At the same time, he says that Unlike human beings, machines can suggest meaning, but they cannot understand it. How would this uh, be uh, implicated in Professor Kato's work? Professor Kato, the floor is yours. If you wish to have any comments further, we would like to um, welcome it. Uh, yes, um, actually, this lecture aims to the um, uh, scientific contribution to the uh, I mean, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Arafat. Uh, you pointed out a very um, a very, very sort of provoking points. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy uh, to hear that. And uh, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this lecture, I I talk uh, from the uh, philosopher's viewpoint, uh, namely the stereoscopic viewpoint. But I, I feel, uh, yeah, also of course, um, AI research uh, concrete work should be complemented, uh, supplemented with my. Theory, so uh, it could. Mm, uh, actually, I'm now collaborating with uh, Taniguchi, so and maybe uh, Taniguchi will watch this uh, archive video. So I'm uh, kind of very looking forward to hear hearing from him. Absolutely. Yes, yes, and we also can have the discussion. Um, backstage uh, with this so we can actually close the live streaming and we can take the discussion backstage we mm -hmm. will allow also other participants to have comments and questions in the meantime uh, i'd like to thank you again professor kato and also dr sachi
for the very insightful and thought-provoking uh, presentation and uh, uh, sharing of comments. Um, and at the same time, to the public watching us out live, the next uh, lecture will be on September 10th, which is 3 p.m. UTC plus one. Uh, the topic is semiotics from Dili to Koto. Uh, speakers, uh, Mario Santiago de Carvalho, together with Helen LeBlanc. On that note, I'd like to thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and looking forward to more questions at the backstage.